going through the Sermon on the Mount, what stood out to you? Which one of the topics covered would you say you need to work on the most? What do you think is the most challenging teaching from the Sermon on the Mount for then and now? Chris and Murdoch take a small pause to reflect on what they've learned so far from the Sermon on the Mount, and they try to tackle these questions and more on this episode of Your Church Friends. All right, welcome to Your Church Friends podcast. I am Chris. And I'm Murdoch. And we are here. We're what I'm going to call just the halftime show for the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, halftime show because we're halfway through the three chapters, basically. Don't don't count the verses and call us out on it. We're roughly the <laughs> halftime show, yeah. But yeah, really looking at this, I know that we can look at, man, these guys are taking forever to just go through three chapters or like in our videos going through Philippians. It's like, that's a short book. How are you taking that many weeks? But to really get in and chew on the scripture and take time to understand what's there rather than just like, oh, well, I did my reading for today and I read those verses and I'm on to the next one. But then I like this idea of having this halftime show just for us to be able to connect and go, hey, We've actually talked about a lot of really, you know, heavy stuff, a lot of stuff that Jesus, he's just coming out the gates with it. Where are we actually at with it? Because we're human beings too. Jesus is talking to us just because we're running a podcast. This <laughs> definitely right. doesn't mean that we've got it all under control. So just to kind of come in and, and check on it, right? Yeah. And, and in between, we've had a few pretty cool um, guest speakers so far. We've had Dr. Atlas Hilaire from our Ignite ministry, talking about marriage, talking about struggles that him and his wife had and how to help other people through them. We just recently had Pastor Doug Jones from Saddleback Church. He stepped in and gave a a pretty cool viewpoint of hypocrisy that I even have a few notes, so when we get there, I'll I'll talk about them. But yeah, it's just coming in and and looking at things. And and then last week we were sitting down and I had mentioned that I I was fasting or that I had fast. You know, we talked about fasting. I thought I should practice fasting and then I, throughout the day when I started fasting, you know, I don't get hungry really, but that day I was hungry. And that day, I, there's little things that I, I did that I never would have done before. Like I made read a peanut butter and butter sandwich and I had a little bit of the peanut butter stuck on my finger and I went to go uh, lick off, lick my finger. And I never do that. Like I usually just like wash my hands and cleaned off, but I went and did that. And then Remy asked for one later. So I made her one, but some of the breadcrumbs, just breadcrumbs. I'm not talking about like huge chunks of the bread, like crumbs got on the table, which I would normally swipe into my hand and throw in the trash. I grabbed two put in my mouth <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I'm fasting. I can't do this. Like what's wrong? And so it, we talked about that and I was like, we were thought like, hey, maybe it's just a good time to kind of share what we were going through and what's been happening through our own personal lives as we've gone through these topics that Jesus has covered so far. Right, because I really feel like when you are studying through Scripture and you're seeking to know God and to grow the relationship, and especially when you bring it to a point of prayer, where you're like, hey God, I want to work on this, he's really good at providing the opportunities to teach and to show, like, hey, you know, God really helped me with my patience. You know what's coming up? A lot of opportunities to practice patience. (laughs) So we get into the thing about fasting, and you're like, all right, I'm going to go for it. And then these things that normally wouldn't, and it just is kind of bringing out what's inside to go, hey, look at what this is looking at that, yeah, to be able to take the time, reflect, and and Jesus says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. Otherwise, you're a fool. So uh, I've got a few questions. If you don't mind, we could go through those and then just bounce around. But before I get into the questions, I kind of, I, I saw this and I thought it was really cool from what we covered, how it broke down the Sermon on the Mount. So it was like, blessings is 5, 1 through 12, when you talk about the Beatitudes, verses 13 through 16, the salt and light is our our influence, verses 17 through 37 of chapter 5 still is the authority, so the authority Jesus came to have fulfilling the law. Which that, for our episodes, so that was 17 through 37, Mm -hmm. so that was Jesus saying, I came to fulfill the law, that was one of our episodes, another one was anger, another one was lust, another one was divorce and oath. And the authority with those ones is learning to have authority over those things in your life. The authority over anger, lust, divorce, which we we really brought into the idea of expectations that we put on other people. And then your oath, man, just do it, say what you're going to say and do what you're going to do. Or the last few is uh, love. How we love is verses 38 through 48, which is eye for an eye, love your enemy. And then authenticity, which is chapter 6, 1 through 18, when it talks about like, when people pray going on and on and on and Jesus then showing us how we should pray, how to be authentic and then fasting, you know, what that looked like. 
authentic fasting versus non-authentic fasting. It's authentic when he says, don't be like the hypocrites. Right. But do this way. And using the teaching opportunity. He wasn't just saying, hey, don't do that. He's saying, but do it like this. Right. So I'm thankful for that. I don't know how many times you've had somebody come and just tell you you're wrong. And you're like, well, thanks, I guess. Like, I knew I was wrong, too. Can you help me with some advice? Yeah. So the first question then I have, going through the Sermon on the Mount, what stood out to you? What stood out to me is just how understandable Jesus is. You know, a lot of times we can get into the point of, and I think I was talking to you about this the other day, that even for preachers and to teachers to stand up and kind of even what we do with this podcast, right, to where we take a section and all we bring in all of this extra stuff into it, right, and really turn it into so much more. But when you're just reading Jesus's words, it's very much like, yeah, like it's direct, it's understandable. I could totally see how him going into poor regions, you know, within the Galilean region and different places that as he is talking to crowds, you know, it's not like he's talking to a bunch of seminary students or a bunch of pastors like, dude, these are some fishermen. These are some, you know, just regular people and just how accessible it is, but that the accessibility, he didn't pull any punches. You know, it was very much meeting humanity where we're at Mm. on so many different levels and on the challenging side of things The hey, you're blessed if it's like this. I was, wait a minute, if I'm in that experience, I would think that I wasn't blessed, (laughs) you know, so I'm poor, I'm poor in spirit and you're telling me I'm blessed. Like, why? So just the perspective that he gives or when it comes into the religious side of things, like, hey, you've heard it said that this is this. But let me tell you where the real issue lies in like a real level of holiness before God where that is. So even though it's so accessible, it also just gets right to it. There's no wasted words with Jesus. Again, I feel like, hey, if, if anybody is to read this, if you if you have a reading comprehension, you know, to be able to read it, then it's kind of there for you. Whereas you can get into some of Paul's writings and it's like, yeah, that's going to take you a lot of studying and pulling Old Testament in and, and doing a lot. Which Jesus does that as well. I mean, he's referring to a lot of different things, but it's just, I think it just really shows God's heart that it's for everybody, this mm. this, this abundant life that he's offering. Yeah, I, I took away from all of it, very similar to what you're saying, was this idea, and even when you look at the Beatitudes, that like what Jesus was doing was he he's taking all of our virtues, our worldviews, and he just throws a grenade in them, <laughs> right? He's like, you thought this, I'm going to tell you this. Mm-hmm. So you thought, Okay, I could tell so and so fool, but I'm telling you when you did that, you've done messed up inside. That when you look beyond, you know, the gaze of just looking at somebody and you're like now your eyes have led you to thoughts and and thoughts that go beyond like, oh, that's a pretty person to like, oh, wow, that's a pretty person. Then something inside is messed up. So your worldview and and your traditions, the thoughts, the values that you all had, the things that you thought would allow you to have a relationship with me. Those aren't it. This is it. This is how you have pure devotion to me. So he almost like he flipped it. You know, he came in and it was just, it was radical. It was revolutionary. Man, really to just be able to sit back and think, I would love to go back and hear this for the first time. I mean, obviously I would need to understand the language, (laughs) right? But take like a little translator guide with you. (laughs) Take Google Translate. Google Translator. Hopefully my Wi-Fi works. (laughs) (laughs) Translate Jesus. You know, sometimes we do need that in our life, a translate Jesus button. Mm -hmm. But just to be able to sit there and see the reaction of the people, because we read it and we just read the words of Jesus, which is great. But the reaction from the people would speak volumes on how actually different this is than what we thought it was. Yeah. And the reaction of the people, doesn't that happen at the very end where they were all just amazed because Jesus came with such authority Mm -hmm. and it really, they go like, hey, he's not like the teachers that we have normally. Like, he's just coming with this authority. And they were just amazed by it. So yeah, definitely the crowd reaction. They were getting something that for us as Christians, if you've been in church for any length of time, you're like, oh yeah, the Sermon on the Mount. And it kind of becomes commonplace. Like, oh yeah, I've read that part. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. but have you? (laughs) Have you received that part? I think that even him throwing the grenade though is that he's living this thing. So he's throwing a grenade, but he's also living out blessed as the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God, right? So we can look at John 3, 16, God sent his only begotten son. Jesus is the son of God, but he's a peacemaker. So he's coming in and he can tell you the harshest thing, but it's bringing peace. You know, it touches on that thing that as humans, we know that when he exposes it, you're like, oh, that is right. 
and I do desire that. And I can see that if I'm living in that way, then I would be at peace with God and with man. That I wouldn't be carried away with these lusts when I'm looking at people. Mm -hmm. That I wouldn't be filled with anger when I'm dealing with people. Like, you know, all these things. But then you're hearing this, this man who's also embodying all of it. And that's what's really cool to where, I mean, there's one thing. You can read books, you can get smart, you can do whatever, and you can tell people what to do. But when you're talking to somebody who lives it and knows it, and Jesus to the utmost perfectly did this, I think that that's kind of what makes throwing the grenade even better. Because if I threw that grenade, you might catch a little bit of sarcasm or bitterness Mm -hmm. or, (laughs) you know, something in there. But I just don't catch that with Jesus. Or even if he comes harshly with something, it's like, that was a fully appropriate way of, of doing that. Right. I like that you brought Peacemaker up, too, because I actually have a quote from John Stott. It says uh, about peacemaking, it says, Now peacemaking is a divine work, for peace means reconciliation, and God is the author of peace and of reconciliation. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that the particular blessing which attaches to peacemaker is, They shall be called sons of God, for they are seeking to do what their father has done, loving people with his love. Mm. So I I thought that was a really cool quote when I was kind of just looking back at the at the Beatitudes and that one right there, like you said, becoming God. Like when we have peace, it brings about reconciliation and it does all these things, which was God's plan and purpose. And even Jesus and what he did, like the grenade, the living it. But ultimately this this sermon, and as we get further into it in the next few episodes, this sermon on the Mount, this is what got him killed because this teaching was so different. And then this teaching isn't just what he said, it's what he did. So he lived all these actions. It's ultimately what led him to the cross was living out the Sermon on the Mount because in it, people are now seeing this and his actions are are so different than what other people's are. So when he says, love your enemy and he's loving his enemy, you know, this is what, what led it there. And again, he says that right out the gate with the Beatitudes, right? That blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. So yeah, this way that he lives and that he's encouraging just this revolution of people to turn against wickedness and step into this righteousness and to kind of go to war in that sense, you know, to where it's like, no, we're standing for what's right. We're going to eradicate from the innermost what's wrong within ourselves. So what we see through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus brings out, like, hey, look inside of you, purge that out, mm-hmm. become this way that God has given you this life to live. And but he calls it out right from the beginning. You live this righteous path. And he says, even for my sake, right, you follow me, persecution comes. And it just seems so weird to me to go. Okay, so we become more loving and we get persecuted. Shouldn't that be the thing that everyone wants the most? Is more Christ-like people walking the earth? It's like, I know I do, but something does happen. (laughs) Well, it it gets into, I think, when we look into the salt and the light, right? So then our influence becomes light. So we are light and we are going into darkness and exposing darkness. And like we talked about, I think, on that podcast, when the room's dark and someone turns on the light, like all of a sudden— you don't like that person because of what it does to your eyes. You're like, oh, man, come on. What's your problem? Why would you do that? You're give me such a warning. <laughs> yeah, like give me a heads up. And I think that's why when we do come in with that light of love, it does that to people, that there is a persecution from it because people don't want to necessarily be exposed for, their, for what they are inside. No one really wants to take a look at and evaluate themselves and say, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe this whole thing of how people are responding to me and acting to me isn't about them, but more about me and what I've done inside. You know, like the Bible says, take a look in the mirror, evaluate yourself. When we don't do that, we just go out and live in the ugly that we are. That's where it talks about the gospel being a stumbling block and an offense because it does come and expose, right? Yeah. But it's the problem isn't the exposing because you have Jesus coming in perfect love and it's just like, He's bringing that, and that's what he's trying to shine on, and so that we can reflect that to others as well. But when it shines on something that's not, and it goes, oh, there's a there's a darkness there, there's a dirtiness there, it really comes down to us. Like, what kind of soil are we, so mm-hmm. to speak? Are we good soil that can receive that and kind of looking at our desire that, hey, you know what? That is dirty. That is dark. I don't want that. 
and that moves into repentance, right? Then fine, turn away from that. And that's the good news of the gospel. In that act of repentance, God's with you all the way right. to welcome you in and forgive the thing and give you the power to overcome it. But if it exposes it, and for whatever reason, the hurt that's in there, or you just still desire the thing, is you're like, yeah, you're telling me not to lust. I like that. Right. <laughs> like, I don't want you to take that away from me. Then you're not going to like the person who... Because I think that deep down inside, everyone knows what's right, unless your conscience has been completely seared. That is just like, mm, I don't like you because you're you're making me feel bad about what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Leave, leave me alone. You're, you're taking away the things that I find pleasure in. Anyways, I think this thing is supposed to be more about us. So if we get back to these <laughs> questions about what stood out the most. Yeah, I mean, we could obviously just read through the whole sermon again because the whole thing stands out. But did you have anything else there? I know I kind of started it off. but I think that was really it for me on my end. It just really was more of like what the words of Jesus in this stood out to me so much more this time the principles that were being laid out than any other time that I've read it and studied it because I don't know, it just, it just hit more like, Oh, anger. Okay. I know I struggle with that, but God's saying like, I need to remove that anger and replace it. So that way you can live at peace. You know, like the principles, again, going back to the principles of the, the Beatitudes, just funneling down throughout the Sermon of the Mount, because this is what I need you to be. And this is who you are. And, and really that was really it. So, uh, I think we should go to our first break or our only break, the break, and... Uh, the halftime show break. The halftime show break. and Halftime we'll, show, halftime show. Yeah, the halftime show, the halftime show. We'll come back, and I got two more questions, and we'll run through those. Cool. This is Reed from YCF Kids News with another episode of Read on the Street to see what podcasts people are listening to. Excuse me, sir. Do you listen to podcasts? Yes, I do. In fact, I host my own podcast. You do? What's your podcast name? It's Your Church Friends. Where can they listen to your podcast? It's available on all your favorite podcasting platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Podbeam. Also, if people want, they can come visit our website, yourchurchfriends.rocks. We have all our episodes up there for people to listen to. A link for our online shop with t-shirts, mugs, and other accessories if you feel like supporting us. Our latest YouTube videos where you can like, subscribe, and share our videos. And a link to join our Facebook group page to get all the latest updates on what's going on with our podcast. Well, thank you for your time. Oh, also you can listen to our podcast on our YouTube channel. And please buy a shirt if you can. Okay, that's Oh, buy a shirt. Buy a shirt. Your church friends dot rocks because we rocks. Get out of here. Ugh. All right. For YCF Kids News, I'm Ree, and this was Ree down the street. Babe, you didn't take out the trash like you promised. I'm sorry, honey. I really meant to, but I just got busy and forgot. You never do what you promise. You say you will do something and you don't. Why can't your yes just be yes? Next time I swear by heaven that I won't let you down. I don't need you to swear by heaven. Next time take this. What's this? It's simply a patch to make sure you do what you say. How does it work? It's simple. You simply put the patch on the back of your neck and the truth chemicals release into your brain to make sure that if you said what you will do, something you do. Wow, it can really be that simple? Then no more broken promises or oaths for me? Yes, and no more disappointment or unmet expectations for me. Our marriage is saved. I love you. I love you. Thank Thank you, you, Simply. Simply is the simple solution to keeping your oath. All right, we are back from that little halftime of the halftime. <laughs> Coming back, I almost want to go, and I'm Murdoch. Like, yeah. Oh, no, wait, that's the other time. <laughs> that's, that's the first time before we get into it. So question number two, which one of these topics covered by Jesus would you say you need to work on the most? So I will jump into that one. And for me personally, I think the areas I need to work on the most was prayer and fasting, both together. I, I just want to throw those two in together as one lump thing because I think when we were talking about it on the episode, I kind of talked about like praying's hard and you kind of looked at me like, no, it's not. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> I just outed myself. But, but for me, praying is a hard thing to do consistently. Like mm. I, I feel like I definitely it's 
you know, someone says, hey, pray for me. Like, I'm not one of those people who will text back, oh, praying for you and just kind of like sent the text. I definitely will pray in that moment. I can pray when someone's like, hey, pray for us as a group, which actually took me a, a really hard time to get comfortable with. I think even when we came back to the church here at Calvary, and me and you were doing the life group together, it'd be like, all right, who wants to pray? Murdoch, can you pray? Please, Murdoch, <laughs> Murdoch, please play. Please, please pray. And I'm always like sitting there when it's like, hey, who wants to pray? I don't volunteer. I like praying and I'll like, I can do it. But it's like, I don't want it to default to me all the time. Cause you know, like mm-hmm. you're saying to get used to doing it and everything else is like, yeah, somebody else do it. It's, it shouldn't be like, a, oh no, what do we? So anyways, I, this is your yeah, thing. I'll so I don't like doing that at all. I just feel like the, you know, you hear people who pray and you're like, man, that's a prayer. That person has, they know how to pray and talk to God. I never feel like just because of sometimes how I stumble over things that my prayer sounds good in public. And when I pray in general by myself, it's more like, God, what's up, man? Like, this is what I'm going through. And, and so it's, it just seems more, it doesn't seem appropriate. But maybe it seems more like what Jesus said, because he said, don't be like the hypocrites and make it about other people's view of you. Right, <laughs> which is something I've learned. I'm learning, especially yeah. in this. So when I'm when I talk about like working on it, I think there's definitely a level of become more comfortable on it. But I really like that. That what stood out to me and really what I want to work out the most is that beginning our Father part. Hallowed be your name, of the Lord's prayer. You know, I, I always felt like yeah, I'm one of those typical Christians who starts off your pr- our prayer as like God, I need this, I need this, I need this. I come in with the laundry list first before I even acknowledge who He is. And so that laundry list seems so big and daunting. But if I actually start off with who he is, which kind of has been my prayer life since, the laundry list doesn't seem as as scary anymore. You know, the things that I'm like fearing or the worries that I have, they don't seem as bad. And, and then fasting itself was just, yeah, I hardly did it. And I think it had been before I I shared with everyone doing it a few weeks ago, it had probably been about four to five years before I actually, since I fasted. And I, I do feel it's a key part of your spiritual life. It's very fundamental to your growth and and not growing or getting things other than knowing God more and, and relying on him more. Like I, you could build trust through fasting because mm-hmm. when you're trusting him to help you out with those stomach cravings and all the, the pain that comes with your body not eating, then when it comes to like the, the stuff that you're facing, you've already got a base level of trust. And the trust building is so crucial. The more that I look at all kinds of stuff, like with following Jesus, it really comes down to like, how much do you trust? Mm -hmm. for everything like well i'm worrying well the answer is trust well i don't know if he'll the answer is trust (laughs) you know so it's like yeah definitely a good tool for building trust is is fasting i hear you yeah i do have one quote that i do want to read and this one helped me it was from rc sproles and it says prayer does change things all kinds of things but the most important thing it changes is us as we engage in this communion with god more deeply and come to know the one with whom we are speaking more intimately the growing knowledge of God reveals to us all the more brilliantly who we are, how our need to change in conformity to him. Prayer changes us profoundly. Mm-hmm. And I really like that. And I had it in the last one in the actual episode. I never just said it because we never really got that way. But that was something that also helped me in this whole like, OK, this I think this is the area in my life that I would say I need work on. Yeah, I like that. The chair, the the chair, (laughs) the (laughs) prayer changes us. And I think that in that changing, right, when we're really praying for God's will to be done, is that, and as we're getting into our Bibles and we're reading and we're learning so much more about who God is and about who we're created to be, is that when our will changes and our desires change to be more of his will and to be more of his desires, it gives the confidence in our prayer because why would he say no to this? Right. You know, if the, we're being spirit led and the spirit is in our life and we know we're praying in the spirit, God's not going to tell God no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it, we're being led by the spirit and he's leading us into these good things. W- with uh, with Casey, my daughter, with, with praying with her, really right now, I just, because she's kind of the same thing. Like, oh, no, I don't want to do the whole prayer. You pray, do the thing. But I make sure that just she starts off the prayer and just start off with, what you're grateful for and even though you're probably grateful for the same things today as yesterday come up with three more new things that you're grateful for really examine your life see what's there that you like tell god thank you for those things Mm. acknowledge what he's doing and say thank you and she'll she'll do the little grateful thing and then i'll come in 
and that's just kind of where I'm at right now with, you know, kind of the teaching and the prayer there. It's like, yeah, see, I'm a pastor on staff at a church and like my kid and that's, you know, how it goes. We all, we all need to learn and, and to teach and to do that. Yeah. Prayer and fasting. Those are big. And by comparison, the thing that I'm the struggle for me would probably see like not as big or as spiritual, <laughs> but I think it's really like, no, we're honestly, I can read the whole Sermon on the Mount and be like, yes, right, that. And I think that's the point of the Sermon on the Mount is for Jesus to come and say, hey, God's way. And we go, ooh, our way, conflict. You know, how do we resolve, resolve this? But right now, a thing for me is what was kind of falls under the oaths and vows section of, you know, kind of let your yes be yes, let your no be no, and just keeping your word. And it's not that I'm going around lying to people or, you know, or breaking that or trying to be manipulative or get get away with things, but it's more so just really examining my life and seeing who am I, what are my roles, what are my responsibilities, what have I said yes to by way of the life that I have. So it's just like, I said yes to my wife. So that means that yes encompasses everything of me being a good husband to her. And when I said yes to marrying her, has my yes truly been yes? You know, am I following mm-hmm. through? Same thing with having a kid. Same thing with, you know, being a, a pastor here at the church and, you know, having my responsibilities here. When I said yes to taking that on, has my yes truly been a yes? And then that comes out. So that's one way of me looking at it. But then another way of me looking at it is just, I want to do so much more than I can do. And I do get myself into situations to where I'll tell someone something and then, you know, maybe it gets pushed to the back. And then I'm trying to get to it or, you know, there's just too many things and I've overloaded myself and it's like, yes, technically in a vacuum, I am capable, I am willing, but really for me working on to where, again, Jesus coming in and saying, hey, if you're going to say yes, do it. Let it be a yes. Don't let other people down. And if your no is a no, then let that be that as well. And kind of I see in there, like, you don't need to carry the guilt. You know, if somebody's coming, it's like, it's much better to just let them know, hey, no, I can't do that. Then to tell them yes, and then, you know, go through the whole rigmarole with it. Yeah, I guess just trying to be more honest with that, with how I how I interact with others and my integrity in it. And then just even being honest with myself as far as what am I capable of? Because it's not everything. I think that's important, too. We had talked about it. I don't know if it was on the podcast or us just talking, like the idea of learning to tell people no. Mm-hmm. which so many people struggle with, I think, if if you really want to help people, being able to say, no, I, I just can't. Knowing our capabilities, our time, and our prior commitments, and then weighing that out with the new one. You know, I, I had an opportunity yesterday that got presented to me, and I, I just, I was honest. I was like, I don't know because of this, 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 and this, but most importantly, my family, because like I, I like how you started that off. My yes to my wife and, my, and to Casey. You know, our yeses need to start there at the home. That, yes, I will be a husband. I will be a father. And if we're not that first, there's there's no way we're going to fulfill other commitments properly. And overarching all of that is my yes to God. Yes. Right? When he comes in and says, I'll, I can be your God if you will be my people, so to speak. You know, going back to that covenantal language, do you want to enter into this covenant relationship with me? And you know what? I told him yes. And I've even done those fantastic prayers of saying, God, whatever it takes Mm -hmm. (laughs) to make me more Christ-like, let's go for that. So I've definitely given given him yeses, big yeses. And yeah, I need to stick by that yes that he's given me a calling in life. And he's given me, you know, again, everything here in the scriptures that we're looking at. And even looking at that, when I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm struggling with my yeses, I look at you like, yeah. Finish the website, Murdoch. <laughs> it didn't even cross my mind. <laughs> Which is where I've learned that deadlines, hard deadlines work fantastically. Aren't they? Yeah. They're the best. All right. Uh, next question. I think uh, what I'll do is I'll let you answer the then and I'll answer now part of it. Okay. And then we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, so what do you think is the most challenging teaching from the Sermon on the Mount then to the people who were listening? Yeah, perfect. I like how you gave me just the most ambiguous come up with your opinion type of questions. So just for clarification, so we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount up until this point, you know, up until halftime show. And what was the most challenging thing for the ancient Israelites to be hearing coming from Jesus? Yes. Yeah, I would say <laughs> all of it, because what that was the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. He's coming 
and you you get to the love your enemies, right? Dude, they were being persecuted and oppressed by a foreign nation that basically moved in and militarized. And yeah, you could look at them as being gracious that they didn't tear down the temple yet. That happened in 70 AD. But they still had their temple. They were still able to, you know, largely function. But no, the Romans were ruling over them. So like, oh, love your enemies. Like I could picture that being really challenging. Or then when he gets to the part of uh, divorce about, you've heard it said, you know, give a certificate of divorce. And during the, the episode that we did on that, we brought in the parallel verses to that, to where Moses had allowed, you know, through that. But Jesus said it was never supposed to be that way. So even challenging there, they're like, yeah, you know what? You guys are doing things, even in the quote unquote religious way that you're doing it. Like, but you're not really like, look at what your marriage is supposed to be. The fact that you made that covenant and you're just throwing that away. Like you're taking this thing that God joined you together and you're just going to separate the thing. So what would be the most challenging? And you go through each thing like that. And again, getting into adultery, even with the lust is that when you look at the way that the ancient world operated and how things were, I mean, a lot of the religious, the, the temple cults and stuff that was there, there was like temple prostitutes to where part of the religious action, not for the Israelites, but for the surrounding nations was like, oh yeah, you go into the temple, you meet with the prostitutes, you do that. And that's part of like your religious experience. So you would have the Jews that were maybe going, well, we're not going and doing that. We're not committing adultery, but boy, do those temple prostitutes look away. And if I could get up there, you know, and mm-hmm. Jesus coming and, and, and approaching that. So in so many different ways, I think that the whole thing is challenging. And I think it's the same way that even when we listen to sermons today is that you can listen to a pastor preach for 15, 30, an hour, an hour and a half, depending on what church you're in or, or what setting. And different people are going to walk out of that message getting hit in different ways. But what's amazing to me is the fact that you brought up this question about then and now is that. Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, and it was applicable then. And which, you, which I'm really glad you brought up, because my answer is the same thing. <laughs> okay. You know, I'm really glad you went that route with it, because that's where I was going in my head. But yeah, now it's there's no difference in any of that. Like, what's the most challenging? What do you think people struggle with today? Lust. Yeah, definitely lust. Uh, lust turns the body, uh, body parts into things, people into animals. Lust represents a lack of control in our life. Lust uh, reflects a lack of respect. Lust is self-gratification. Lust is dangerous and affects your marriage or future marriage. Lust destroys marriage. We gave uh, websites for lust on, on if you're struggling with this area in your life, and, and I'll put them in the description below, some resources on it. But then that turns into if you're married, if you're married and then this is an issue, well, that can... You lead to divorce, lead, lead to, to div- anger, lead, lead to, to yeah. anger, lead to divorce, lead to everything. And, and even the, the, your oath, your yes, that this is my commitment to somebody and you're, you've already broken that. And even loving your enemies, you know, that, that's such a big one. I think today is loving your enemies. Now nah, we just cancel them. <laughs> we just cancel them, delete them, unfriend them, unfollow them. You know, you I don't s- need toxic people in my life. Exactly. Actually, you saw- want me to walk a mile with a toxic person? No, Jesus. I actually saw something up and it said uh, it was someone doing something nice for another person, like putting a bandage person. And it was a meme and the person getting the bandage. It was like the toxic person in my life. And then the person putting the bandage on said me still doing something nice for the toxic person, even though I know I shouldn't. And it was it was basically the idea of like, you know, why do I do this with toxic people? And, and or it's like it basically saying that that's not a good character trait. Mm. right and then my thought was but isn't that the most christ-like character trait to have who's ever gonna love them exactly who's gonna help these people who's gonna be there to help these people these people you consider enemies these people who have a different viewpoint of you different belief as you different political idea than you who's gonna love them but yeah our culture today is so simple and like unfollow unfriend i don't need you in my life i'll stay in my vacuum because I like my vacuum, it tells me the information I want to know and the information that I like, and this is where I'll sit and live. And we eliminate our enemies instead of loving them. And Jesus saying, praying for them, go the extra mile for them. So what's challenging then and now? All of it. Because at the center of the Sermon on the Mount is the core idea of love, loving God, and loving other people. And that's still 
those it's it's two simple things, right? I love God, I have to love other people. And at the center of that, that is where I struggle because if I don't love God right, I can't love people right. And if I'm not loving people right, I definitely don't love God right. I think I'm just going to say this part because we're in election time and we're recording this, you know, just prior to the election. But I was trying to check the calendar to see if it'll get posted after. Either way, it's still fresh on everyone's minds. We can just go with the stereotypical that, you know, a lot of Christians are Republican. How are you loving those Democrats? (laughs) <laughs> or vice versa yeah or vice versa i was just going with the stereotype yeah. but uh we see you on facebook yeah oh sorry this was supposed to be about us <laughs> or then and now yeah or then and now yeah but uh it's a, it's all good points you know <laughs> it, it really is because in the simplicity of that like i don't know if i said it here i think it was a message for belong but god what he's doing is the one thing that he did when he unified us together as one group even with the children of Israel, to now what we call Christianity, but I just want to say people who follow Christ, what he did is bringing us all together is to be under the category of love. Mm-hmm. And if we're not under that, then then we've missed the mark. We've missed the boat, man. And and it's just, it's, it's such a shame to look at the Sermon on the Mount uh, from the perspective of halfway through there. And yeah, there are things that have ouched me. There are things that have like, oh man, I'm not doing that. But to look at it and say, that hurts, so I don't need to have that in my life. I think that a lot of what we mentioned was more within the Matthew 5 realm of things. But mm-hmm. getting to Matthew 6, I do want to point out between then and now that the religious hypocrisy when mm-hmm. it comes to prayer, you know, fasting, uh, giving to the needy, just all of what religion can be propped up and marketed to be and all of the things that, you know, any religion is capable of it. Um, but I think that we can talk to our own So really when it comes to like these ministries that, you know, exist out in the world, especially in America, which is what I'm most familiar with, and we don't even need to go into the realm of like, oh, mega churches with, you know, pastors on TV and stuff, but really bringing it into the realm of the hypocrite. Are we as individuals hypocrites? Which again, in the original setting, are you putting on a mask, pretending to be something other than you are? Are you putting on that religious mask so that you can do the quote unquote religious things and make it look good from the outside, but really behind that mask, there isn't the love of what you're speaking about, right? Mm-hmm. That the whole intention is off and you know, you're not addressing the the sin. You said, hey, those things are hurtful. I'm, I'm going to get rid of them. Have you actually got rid of them? And I find that that's a huge thing. I've gone through it to where at a certain point in my life, I was struggling with a couple, you know, sin areas. And that would be the thing that I would point out in other people. I'm just going to throw that out there. If you're doing that, people can tell. I like that so, you brought that up too. So if you're if you're coming hard on people and you are struggling with that sin, just know that people might see through you and mm-hmm. know that that's what you're struggling with. And it exposes you as a bit even bigger hypocrite because people know. Yeah. And even if they don't, I'm pretty sure the Bible says your sin will find you out. So. And I do think that that is something that is a that is a big struggle then and a big struggle now also is the hypocrisy, right? The Pharisees were going around like everyone knew those are the the people who made entering into God's kingdom so much more difficult. And then they did all the like glorifying of themselves while they did things. The hypocrisy of it all, Jesus called them out on their hypocrisy, called them whitewashed tombs, just came you, at them. You brood of vipers. Brood of vipers, which I don't really even understand what that means, but it sounds bad. But it, he came at them in that hard way. And, and I liked what Doug said, so I'm going to say it again. At the root, hypocrisy is a lie. Then at the root, authenticity is the truth. And to me, that was like, that's it. When It's not about being perfect because hypocrisy, there are people who put on the mask that say they're perfect, but no, they aren't. Authenticity is I'm not perfect and I'm willing to tell you that I'm not. And I think as the church in whole, where we struggle at today and why the world sees us as hypocrites, is that as you stay in the church longer and longer and longer and you grow in it, the room to be imperfect slowly starts getting smaller. We don't allow pastors and leaders to be somewhat imperfect and flawed because if we are, we look at them differently. The pedestal view that we put on them gets changed. But if we really allowed longtime Christians and and, uh, leaders within the church to come up to the pulpit or wherever they're sharing at and say, I struggle with anger. I struggle with lust. I struggle with 
doing what I say I'm going to do. I struggle with my prayer life, my reading. I struggle and allow that to happen, then the church would be a much better light and a beacon for everybody because then it's that that issue that could have been resolved then doesn't get resolved and it lingers, lingers, lingers because they have no one to tell until finally the secret is exposed and then there's shame on everyone in the church. Yeah, there's a thing in Celebrate Recovery, or at least around here, and say you're only as sick as your secrets. Mm Mm-hmm. But I do want to hold something in tension with what you just said, is that, yeah, the longer that you're within this, you know, Christianity, that your permission, so to say, as far as being imperfect, seems to like go away. Like, no, 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 you, you should have this by now. Like, wh- what are you doing so struggling? To where it's just like, no, we should always allow, you know, humanity and hey, wherever we fail, allow grace to abound even more, right? Mm-hmm. But then scripture comes in and says, does that mean that we should go on sinning because grace will abound? God forbid. So I think that it's those two things in, t- in intention is that we should always pour out grace on people who have failed and are repentant and, you know, need the grace because that's what God does for all of us. However, we should have the expectation that the longer that somebody is pursuing God, they should be becoming more mature in these areas, Right. You shouldn't be as angry of a person three years later. You shouldn't be as lustful as a person three years later, right? Paul comes in at one point and says, hey, by this time, I should be like bringing you guys into some more mature stuff, but you're over here like babies with your milk. Like you should be further ahead. So I think that to have those two things in tension, to have an expectation of growth, but also have an understanding of humanity, Mm-hmm. And marry those two because if we're only ever excusing people like, oh yeah, everybody sins, everybody sins, everybody sins. And I it's think just the like, understanding mm. with growth is the important part. Yeah. As I garden and we do a lot of stuff, I think I've shared this with you is that uh, sometimes something planted in the same soil right next to each other, the same plant getting the same care, the same nutrients, one plant just sprouts up and it's a full blown growing and producing fruit, while another one slowly does and it struggles. It eventually gets there and it produces the fruit. But I think that's where I, th- I think that grace of like allow allotment because everyone's growth process is different. Everyone's growth and change, it, it varies. And that's what makes the honesty, the authenticity yeah. so essential. Because if we can meet each other where we're at, then we can know how to help each other where we're at. Yeah. It's when we don't know where people truly are. So we put expectations of where they're not or where we think and all the stuff to where just like, yeah, it becomes a one size fits all kind of a thing. Or we put the expectations on ourselves. Yep. I've been doing this so long. Why do I still struggle with this? Why is this still part of my life? <laughs> Why are you attacking me? I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking <laughs> myself. I said I. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm looking at you and saying yeah. it. Is that the problem? Why am I still struggling? I've been doing this so long. Say, I didn't look at you. They don't know that, but I look the other way. And, and I think we got to give ourselves the same grace that we apply to other people, mm-hmm. take off that expectation and do that. But we are way past the time I said we would try to get on this one. I love this. And maybe we'll do a whole Sermon on the Mount recap at the end of everything. Maybe it'll just be second half. Second Is half it, yeah, or second something. Half recap. But, uh, we got a lot of cool stuff coming up with the podcast. We got a, a lot of cool guests coming on. One of our pastors here, Pastor Zachariah, he's going to come on with uh, one of us and talk about prayer and fasting specifically. And I have an old mentor of mine coming on. You know, we're, we're moving into a lot of cool things with this. So that way it's just not our perspective, but... As your church friends, we want to bring in our friends to be your friends so that we're all friends and uh, and just grow in that. But I'm really enjoying what we're doing so far. I think we're at this point 11 episodes plus in, maybe more than that. I think maybe 15 actually. But this has been cool and I hope everyone's been enjoying it. Yes. Yes. All right. So <laughs> for your church friends, I'm Chris. And I'm Murdoch. And thank you for listening. I see I got to say it there. Yeah, you did. Hi. I'm Lusters of Lusters Prosthetics, the number one retail warehouse of quality prosthetics. Here at Lusters, we believe in one simple philosophy. Be the best. We don't need a fancy jingle or music to go with our ads because we are the best. Because our customers deserve the best. From head to toe, literally and figuratively, we have the best quality and prices. Don't waste your time lurking all over the internet. Lusters is the very best. When you're the very best, next day shipping without all of the gouging fees isn't a problem. Here at Lusters, we make it happen. We cut out the middleman and go direct to the manufacturer to ensure that our products are made using the best material ever, such as top grade leather, solid wood, and high density foam. Because if Lusters claims to be the best, 
our quality must be the best. Through our own in-house scientific research and extensive studies, we are more than certain no one can come close to providing you with a better quality prosthetic. Right eye, Lusters has you covered. Hand, Lusters can surely help you with that. All with the peace of mind that your satisfaction is guaranteed. Remember, if there wasn't any lust, there wouldn't be Lusters prosthetics. Lusters, being the best at prosthetics since 1972.